Hi, friends. It's been a very long time because, can you see me down here in the corner? Way down here, over this way. Look behind me. All my books are gone because Uncle Jerry's moving again. So all my books are in boxes and I haven't had a chance to go to the library a lot. So I thought I'll just go ahead and get some ebooks so we can at least read together. So that's what you're seeing now are the ebooks that I got for us today. So we have three books, one, two, three. We have The Color Collector, Blue Floats Away, and we have Aaron Slater, Illustrator. Three books that I hope you will like. You can kind of see a color theme going on here, can't you? Let's do The Color Collector first. takes a long time to open this kind of stuff sometimes. Not as easy as a book, but you can still see it. Here we go. The Color Collector by Nicholas Solis and Pictures by Renia Metalino. Look at all those colors and all those scraps of paper. Oh, but this isn't very colorful. She was new. She was quiet. I think she was lonely. That was the day I met Violet. I was new once. I said hello. She smiled a little, I think but she was quiet. You see any color in this picture? Violet is the girl sitting on the bench reading. Look at her hair. Do you see any color in her hair? I do. She lived near me. We walked home the same way. I was on one side, she on the other. Always quiet, always alone, every day the same, until one day. The day she picked something up. The wind blew strong. A red candy wrapper did somersaults. It landed at her feet, hugged her shoe. Violet picked it up, the bright red wrapper. Then it was gone, disappearing into her backpack. She looked up. She looked at me. She waved. Then her eyes went down and she turned the corner. I'm seeing more color in the book. We had purple in Violet's hair and then red with the wrapper. But now in the other picture, I'm seeing some purple and some more red too. She was always picking things up. I had never noticed it before. Now it is all I see her do. Bright blue cookie wrappers, yellow pieces of paper, green bottle caps, red fall leaves, all disappearing into the gray backpack. One day on our silent walk home, I am not so silent. What do you do with it all? All of what? The wrappers and trash and leaves. Do you really want to know? Yes, please. Then follow me. We're going to a building. Looks like her house. Just a little farther. Up one flight of stairs. Then another. And another. The heavy door creaks open. This is my room. Here in her room, the sun comes to shine. It reaches in and makes her glow. It makes her collection glow as well. Each brightly colored wrapper piece of trash and speckled leaf has a place on her walls, her ceiling, her door, 
they are no longer forgotten bits blowing in the wind. Along her wall, they are one. They are her sky, her beach, her village. They are beautiful. We came here for a better life. I miss home, though. I miss the sounds and smells, and I miss the colors. I am sad that she is sad. It is beautiful, I say. She tells me stories about her sun, her ocean, her people. We sit and talk, then laugh, then talk some more. She is not so sad. She is not so alone. It feels good to be her friend. I say goodbye. She says goodbye. I'll see you tomorrow. It is true. She smiles. I smile. We smile the same. On my way home, the wind blows strong and cold. A bright red leaf falls at my feet. I pick it up and put it in my backpack. Da end. Now we know where all those colors came from and what all those scraps of paper were. That's a beautiful book. Let's see what other colors we have. We have blue floats away as our next book. I think blue is an iceberg, a big block of ice in the ocean. Blue floats away. Words by Travis Yonker. And pictures by Grant Snyder. And look, there's a lighthouse. That red and white building, it's a lighthouse on the ocean. Blue floats away. Little Blue lived near the North Pole with his parents. They were close. One day, crack! Blue was suddenly on his own, floating away. Blue was surprised. Blue's parents were surprised. No one was prepared for this. I'll be back soon! Blue called as he floated away, but he wasn't so sure. Before long, Little Blue couldn't see his parents anymore. He couldn't see anything except this. He began to wonder if he would ever make it home again. What is he seeing? I think it's just the ocean and the dark sky and lots and lots of snow. After days and days of nothing, Blue began to see things. New things. I think he found some sharks. Beautiful things. Pretty sailboats. He was so happy to have company. Blue learned things from his new friends about wind and ocean currents, things that could help him get home. Blue planned his return. But something unplanned was happening. It was getting warmer and Little Blue was getting smaller and smaller and smaller until he disappeared.
He's gone because he's made of ice. And look at that big yellow sun. It got too hot. He melted. Blue's friends didn't know what to do. So they went on their way. But Blue wasn't gone. He was changing. If you look really closely in the water all the way across the page from the sailboat, you can still see Blue's eyes and his mouth in the water. Blue mixed with the ocean water, evaporated, condensed, and was transformed. What is Blue now? He's a cloud. He's up in the sky. He went from the ocean into the sky. Soon, Blue began to see things, new things, beautiful things. Blue learned things from his new friends about the directions, east, west, south, and north. Blue set a course for home. On the way, he visited old friends. There's the shark in the sailboat again. It was getting colder and little blue was getting bigger and bigger and bigger until a snowflake. Look how big he got. Little Blue saw his parents again. Were they ever surprised? He went from an iceberg to a snowy cloud. And there's his journey. He went from a cloud to snow to an iceberg, back to a cloud. So check out this book from the library and it tells you about the water cycle and how water goes from all these different forms and goes again and again and again and again and again. The end. One more colorful book. Aaron Slater, illustrator. Oh, that's the end of the book. We gotta go to the front of the book. Aaron Slater, Illustrator, words by Andrea Beatty, and pictures by David Roberts. And when I say pictures by David Roberts, the person who draws the pictures of a book is called the illustrator. Aaron Slater looks like a good illustrator. Those are some great flowers. Graph paper for his drawings. Aaron Slater, illustrator. At the end of the garden in the soft fading light, when the day turns to dusk and the dusk into night, the sweet scent of jasmine floats into the air to mix with the music of laughter. And there, Aaron D. Slater soaks it all in with his flowery blanket tucked under his chin. Words drift like music, melodious, mild. A sweet summer song for a sweet summer child who drifts off to sleep as the cottonwoods sway at the end of the garden. The end of the day. It's summer, then summer, and summer once more. And soon, Aaron D. is a youngster of four. The jasmine climbs higher, the roses have grown, and Aaron himself has a spot of his own for seedlings and saplings beside the slate walk, which he illustrates daily with a bucket of chalk. Do you like to draw on the sidewalk with chalk? But 
what he loves most, what makes Aaron's heart sing, is to listen to books in the old garden swing, to write stories, he thinks, is the greatest of things. But first, he must read. It's the best place to start, and young Aaron wants to with all of his heart. But the words are just squiggles. Try though he might, even with help, Aaron can't get it right. Why can't I do it? Why is it so hard? He goes back to drawing on slate in his yard. It's school time at last. In his sunflower socks and poppy red jacket with matching lunchbox, he marches to class with a teacher's bouquet, ready to read by the end of the day. But he doesn't that day, or that month, or that year. And though he makes progress, it's painfully clear he'll never quite get it like all of his friends. Since he'll never stand out, he decides to blend in. And so here he is at the start of grade two in his simple white t-shirt and matching white shoes. He tries to keep up, to blend in, and to hide the tangle of feelings he carries inside. At first, it goes well, since his teacher is new and a bit overwhelmed by the hullabaloo, but things settle down and Miss Greer finds her stride, and once she gets rolling, there's no place to hide. Class, she says, here's an assignment for you. Write me a story. Write something true. Everybody looks really excited. What does Aaron look like? He looks a little worried and sad. And so Aaron does what young Aaron must do. He works on a story like the rest of grade two. He writes through the evening. He writes through the night. He writes and he writes till the dawn's early light. Then he drags off to school with his shoes filled with lead and his stomach in knots and a pain in his head. And he waits for his turn with his heart filled with dread. Miss Greer calls his name, and Aaron D. stands and unfolds the sheet in his trembling hands. When he reads, well, he tries, but it's so hard to start with 33 eyes peering into his heart. So he stares at his shoes and his sunflower socks, closes his eyes, and then young Aaron talks. Once, well, once there was a flower. No, wait, I know. There was a magical flower, which gave all who held it extraordinary power. So begins the most perfect of tales of an imperfect hero whose courage fails when the day turns to dusk, dusk into night, and the moon rises high and the dragons take flight. And who learns after all in the wee morning hours, strength comes from the heart and not magic or flowers, that beauty and kindness and loving and art lend courage to all with a welcoming heart. And when the quest ends and the sweet flower dies, the students all gasp and Miss Leela Greer dies. The silence that follows rattles his heart. He tries to say something, but where could he start? He turns in a paper with no words at all, then blinks back a tear and escapes to the hall where Miss Leela finds him by the slate-colored wall. Time stops for them both the teacher and boy. His heart fills with anguish, and hers? Hers fills with joy at the soul of this artist courageous and true. She smiles and whispers, Aaron, thank you.
When she leaves, Aaron stands there a very long while, then slowly, so slowly, he begins to smile, and he feels like he does with those books in the swing. As a new hope inside starts to make his heart sing, he knows he can do the greatest of things in a way that's his own, in a way that's just his. He can stand out and show the whole world who he is. Like the mightiest flames that banish the dark, hope grows in the soul from the tiniest spark. His art makes a difference. His art leads the way and helps him discover what he wants to say. And his reading gets better. Of course, it's still tough, but each day that they work is a little less rough. Like all imperfect heroes at the start of a quest, he must do what he can and hope for the best. Now in the hallway, a new garden grows with jasmine and poppies, a rambling rose, books, art, and music, a dragon or two who soar through a sky of delphine and blue. The art tells a story, melodious, mild, furious, fragrant, wonderful, wild. It's all from the heart, and all of it's true, for Aaron, Miss Greer, and the kids of grade two. It's a place full of beauty, for one and for all. The Illustrator's Garden at the end of the hall. The end of that book and the end of our story time. Do you see me still? Way down here. Hello. Okay, you can see me good. Pull out your fist. Stick out your... Uh-huh. Pointy finger. And your... Pinky finger, and your thummy finger, and this means, I love you. I'm way down here and small, so I have to wave like this, and my voice has to get high like this. Ready? I love you, goodbye. I love you, goodbye. I love you, I love you, I love you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I love you.